Hey everyone, this podcast is part of Story Mode, the podcast network of Gamefully Unemployed. You can support us and gain access to other great exclusive podcasts at patreon.com slash gamefully unemployed. That's patreon.com slash G-A-M-E-F-U-L-L-Y unemployed, which is spelled like it sounds. Let's set it off. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. My Hello. name is David Bell. I'm Tom Ryman. I am guest Jason Pargin, a.k.a. David Wong. And we just watched Dragged Across Concrete. We have some thoughts. A single red ant could have eaten it faster. You're losing perspective and compassion. There's a reason. I'm sitting behind this desk running things. And you're out there with a partner that's 20 years younger than you. Hey, Anthony's got a mouth with his own engine, but he's solid. I'm thinking about the kind of future I can offer my girlfriend. Pops is a yesterday who ain't worth words. Good heavens and praise be to him. Your absence was a weight upon us. Thank you, Mr. Edmonton. I don't like doing things with so many question marks everywhere. There's a lot of imbeciles out there. <laughs> that title is apt for many reasons. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, we, we tend to do this. This uh, podcast tends to be like whatever's new and out uh, that weekend. Yeah. And there were a couple we could have done like Eurovision or uh, My Spy, I think. Sure. Hit Prime. Neither of which I'm very interested in. But Jason, you kind of suggested this to us with with some thoughts behind it yeah and i that should be made clear right from the top no one should be blamed for this movie <laughs> or us discussing it other than me uh this is this is that rare movie i i feel like all good art should leave you changed somehow it should not just pass through you and leave nothing behind dragged across concrete really, I think, made me a slightly worse person <laughs> than I was before I watched it. Um, so it's fascinating on that level. There is a lot to unpack here. Yes. Yeah. That's the other thing. We don't normally do. We just watch with specific theses. Uh, in this case, I think it's very much warranted. It's uh, I, 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 I can't recommend this movie off the top. Uh, uh, the top of this podcast that's one way to express it yes <laughs> yeah I, which is i mean so the direct the writer director is s craig zoller who made bone tomahawk and brawl on cell block 99 which are i mean i really liked bone tomahawk uh, cell block 99 i thought was still pretty good so uh i think we can say he's a good filmmaker he's a good filmmaker but <laughs> I would he, I would go as far as to say this is not a bad movie in terms of how it's made. Yes. No, I, it's not. I, I believe that it does what it intends to do. I believe that it yes. is effective in creating the mood it wants to create. It's just that once you examine that mission, uh, it, it's like in the same way that O.J. Simpson's Twitter account is a good Twitter account. And it, it's, <laughs> right. it, it consistently has tweets that you, you want to read, but it's like... Man, am I am I making the world worse by following him? Yeah. <laughs> uh, just just to see if people listening can see the pattern that we're getting to. Uh, Bone Tomahawk is a film about how Native Americans uh, are like monster cannibals, right? Mm -hmm. Did I get that right? They're, Cell, they're quite literally called troglodytes in the yeah. movie. Brawl in Cell Block Ninety Nine stars Vince Vaughn as a white man with a shaved head going to jail and yep. uh attacking a lot of uh dark-skinned folk uh dragged across concrete is about two racist cops <laughs> who get in trouble for stepping on a man's neck on camera uh then fighting uh over gold um and i want to note that this director also wrote the film uh puppet master the littlest reich which is about <laughs> Nazi pu puppets murdering minorities. So I wonder if people can see the pattern we're getting at here. Yeah. Now, it, uh, should, <laughs> it should be noted, I, I did not know any of this 
like I because I saw this pop up on one of the streaming services back. I guess it came out in 2018. It's a direct to streaming movie. I'm going to guess some of the people listening to this have just literally never heard of it. Yeah. Um, but it popped up on the streaming service, and so based on I guess the trailer or the description, it came across to me as this is about an aging crazy person whose life is derailed by a racism scandal and he turns to a life of crime after that and oh by the way the aging crazy person who gets life is derailed by racism scandal is played by mel gibson yes and his partner yeah his partner is vince vaughn and so at that point it's like well you don't have to ask me twice this is (laughs) This is going to be a train wreck. I will pay any amount of money to watch this. And and again, anyone listening, I am not defending that action on my part. This is a (laughs) flaw in my personality. I'm working on it. But if you promise me that Mel Gibson made an action movie that kind of seems to be about his real life, which turns out is not what happened, but that was what it drew me to it. Because it's like, oh, there's no way I can not watch this, especially somebody whose job is to write about and comment on pop culture. It's like, no, this cannot escape my notice. Um, and my impression is Vince Vaughn, is he like a, he's like a Republican actor, yes. right? Is he, is yes. he been seen in like a red hat or whatever, or am I he thinking is, of someone else? I believe he's a Trump supporter, right? I'm going to Google it. Um, Let's Google it so that we do not uh, yeah, slander I, I, Vince I, Vaughn. I know he's conservative, but yeah. Um, yeah, that was one of the things that, for having been a fan of, of this director's first two movies and not really like it just like I, I recognize that both of those films were about otherism, but maybe I was giving them the benefit of the doubt when I was like, well, they're kind of about how everybody is an other, you know what I mean? Like we sort well, of end up becoming monsters for other people. And for example, in uh, bone Tomahawk, the, the whole thing with them going against a tribe of, troglodytes is that they're differentiating the, the the whole deal is that normally a western would be you know about cowboys coldly slaying you know indians and mm-hmm. this movie it's like oh no these are not these are not uh, apache these are something else they, there's some race of subhumans that exist right there there are literal subhumans subhuman so cave dwellers it, it's like he does it almost to make an argument that well this is okay like this is not the typical uh, you know because the whole thing is they're like having to try to rescue uh, a white person who's been kidnapped by um these these savage tribes or whatever <laughs> so it's easy to watch it and say well he's trying to make a traditional Western the way they would have existed in the fifties, but he's trying to update it by like, well, mm-hmm. it's there. Yeah. They're kind of like zombies or whatever. Like, well, like you don't have right. to feel it's bad like about the, it. It's like the first half of the searchers essentially. I, I think that's what really interests me is that this feels this director. It's almost the ultimate dog whistling. Cause any one thing he's done, you can go, well, it's probably not that. Like right. it's the fact that it's so <laughs> then many it starts to add up and it starts to add up. And then when you read between the lines and the way in his interviews, he distances his, himself. He doesn't, he says he's like, ex- well, you, you know, you come to whatever. It, yeah. yeah. He's very evasive. It reminds me of like Ben Shapiro where Ben Shapiro is very much like, look, I'm just saying stuff. I'm just, I'm just, you know, brainstorming I'm stuff. I'm just asking questions. I'm just, and it's like, isn't it weird? Because also cell block was, uh, really liked by white supremacists uh and so it's the thing where it's like don't you think it's weird that white supremacists really like your work uh uh isn't it weird that all your things keep falling back on that but no but again he's evasive enough that it's like the okay hand signal yeah because you sound like a crazy person being like that's a nazi thing and it's like no that's a game we played and it's like well it became like they they diluted it so that it's they can they can fall back on no it's just a joke and so everything this guy makes you can sort of justify it um because he's evasive enough but then when the, when you really look at like this movie dragged across a concrete the more you look at it the more you're like hey what the hell is this what are you trying to say <laughs> yeah so would it be helpful to just kind of circle back and summarize the plot for people who have not and may never 
watch this movie because it's we're going to uh, allude to a lot of things that occur, but you kind of have to understand what the film yeah, is I think, about. I th- yeah, I think that's worth doing in this since we're 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 approaching this with a specific thesis we want to talk about. So yeah, I think I think that's a good idea. Who yeah. feels up to doing that? Jeez. <laughs> Oh jeez, um, um, I, I I can give it a shot. I guess you're you're better at it than me, Tom. That's for sure. But yeah, uh, you do. <laughs> You've <laughs> seen my recaps. Sometimes certain details just completely pass you by. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> I don't watch movies so much as I absorb them. <laughs> I just let them crash over me like a uh-huh. wave. Yeah. Um. So the movie begins with the character Henry, who just got out of prison. Um, he's a young black guy. Um, he goes back to his mom's apartment and where she's like a drug addict. Um, and his brother is disabled, is in a wheelchair. Um, so he's talking with his childhood friend, I think, who is, uh, Michael J. Waite from, uh, Black Dynamite. Um, and they're basically talking about they're going to do some kind of jobs that he can make some money quick to help out his family. Um, and then we cut to Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn, who are two cops staking out this uh, drug dealer's house. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, in the process of arresting him, they're a little too rough with him, which is, yeah. I, have a, I have a lot to say about that later. But yeah. like they, they handcuff they, him, and Mel Gibson is like standing on his head a little bit. He's standing like uh, kind of on his neck. Uh, yeah. It's, it's accidentally topical to today yeah yeah um so they get they, somebody films that they get in trouble for it they get suspended for six weeks um and then we see uh mel gibson's family his his wife is disabled as well um he, so it, it really like hits you over the head with we're not so different you and i <laughs> um but his his wife is disabled as well his daughter's constantly getting bullied and they're worried about it escalating so he really wants to move out of the neighborhood they're in um, and this is all couched in, in an incredibly racist conversation he has with his wife. Yes. Um, so he decides he's going to go ask for a favor from uh, Vampire Lord Udo Kier mm-hmm. to uh, get a tip about some somebody, some dealer or some buyer he can rip off. And he brings Vince Vaughn in on it, um, who is reluctantly uh, agrees to go along with it, uh, but is very much like, well, we can't kill anybody. I'm not going to kill somebody to rob somebody. And I'm, I'm, I'm in it until I'm out. So, um, they end up staking out this guy, uh, <clears throat> who turns out to be the ringleader of a team of three, just absolute maniacs. Yeah. Um, who are white. They're all white. Yes. Uh, yes. one of them in particular at each each scene we see him in, he makes some sort of racist comment about the people he's about to murder. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, they are, they orchestrate a bank robbery basically. And we check back in with Henry and his friend. I don't think I ever heard Michael J. White's name, character's name in this movie, but it's him and Henry are the drivers for these bank robbers. And they go rob a bank where they, absolutely massacre everybody inside um and then they drive out to this remote location and the whole time vince vaughn and mel gibson are tailing them they get to the remote location where they have a shootout uh vince vaughn is killed by a hostage that they forced to crawl out there and 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 attack them or else they would go to her house and kill her family um michael joe white is killed uh mel gibson kills the rest of the bank robbers he and henry make a, a a shaky truce to bury all the bodies and split the gold 60 40 um because henry has video of of mel gibson shooting the hostage lady which uh, we're going to talk about that too yeah. <laughs> but uh at the very last moment after they've pushed a, a mel gibson's shot up car into the lake um and they they've gotten all the the gold out of the van and they're about to go back and bury the bodies Mel Gibson pulls a gun on Henry and is like, the deal's still intact. I just, I just want to get your cell phone because um, we should be even. Like the fact that either one of us can rat the other one out at any given time should be enough insurance for both of us. If you they're have that also, video, you have more leverage on me. And they're also, yeah, splitting the gold unevenly. They are, but Henry's right. getting more of it. Henry's getting more, right? Mel yeah. isn't? 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. He, that's, I think has, that's important. He has the, yeah. He later. has the video. And at first, Henry says 70 30, and then Mel's like 60 40. And he's like, all right, fine. Yep. Um, so he doesn't want to give him the phone. It escalates. Uh, Henry ends up shooting Mel. And before he dies, Mel's like, look, can you bury my partner? I don't want him involved in this. Um, and then Henry's like, yeah, it would, did, were you lying to me about your family? He's like, no, that's true. And he's, he's like, all right, well, I'll make sure your, your wife and your, your daughter get some money. Um, so Henry buries them all. He takes the money. It cuts to a year later where he's living in a, a fabulous mansion. And I guess at Malibu? I don't, I don't know. know. Oh, I thought it was outside the United States. I thought they had gone to Belize or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, because the town, it t- the city it takes place in is fictional too, right? It's called like... Yeah, it's called Bulwark. Yeah, Bulwark, it's- Bulwark yeah. Um, we learn he's made like a whole bunch of money in investing in stocks and shit. Um, he sends gold back to uh, Mel's wife and daughter. Um, and that's pretty much it. He yeah. sits down to play a game with his brother, and he's like, let's play that old hunting game where we're hunting lions. Let's hunt some lions. And that's yeah. what the, the line the movie ends on. Yes, there's there's a lion thing where earlier he's playing with his brother on this lion hunting game, and he says, this seems like rich old white man stuff. Yep. At the same time, Mel Gibson is watching lions on TV, lion cubs. Lion cubs, yeah. And then the arc is basically at the end, he goes, let's go hunt some lions. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important to note as yes. well. So, uh, but before we start unpacking all this, I guess we do have to grant that that the overall plot winds up in a way where the only like morally pure person is Henry, the, the, a black guy who is just trying to get some money to his mother and his brother, and he goes along with his heist and sees how sadistic these bank robbers are, and he basically he and the other guy basically stop the whole thing they 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 pull out guns and start shooting and so and in the end you know there's the final moments for mel gibson's character is he's basically bleeding out and henry just looks at him like and literally says you dumbass yeah like right. all you had to do he's implying all you had to do was not be racist for the next five minutes and trust a black guy to not screw you over and you get away with with like a hundred million dollars in gold they have right. a lot of gold they've stolen it's a here. shitload of gold it's a yeah. it's a ton it's actually more than what that car would be able to drive with it in right its, trunk. it's it's four completely full duffel bags of gold and it's yeah. like that thing would be riding solo <laughs> yeah each of those bags would weigh 800 pounds in real life but <laughs> yes um so you anyone wants to defend the movie there'd be two points to bring up one that ultimately the real protagonist was Henry because he gets out of it and he's the only one who sticks to his word and tries to have some sort of a moral code. Mm -hmm. And that basically Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn both die and Mel Gibson literally dies of racism. The other thing, (laughs) the other thing would be that knowing, especially in the mood in 2020, knowing what we know about how a lot of police departments operate and the kind of the culture of police that there's this bunker mentality where it's not, it's more than just race. It's like the media is against us. You know, the politicians are against us. And it's like this, that the conversation that they have when he, after he gets caught on camera, stepping on that guy's neck. And then he talks to his boss played by Don Johnson and they have the most casually racist conversation you'll ever <laughs> hear in a movie. The scene Someone, is, it's equally incredible because they all but look into the camera and are like, isn't it a shame that the media is so intolerant when they claim to be tolerant? Uh, like, right. it's, it's embarrassing. But, but if you took the transcript of that scene and said, hey, this is actually a real transcript of a conversation that happened in the NYPD when these two cops talked to their chief, including the little casual racist jokes, including... That the chief making a reference to, well, the head of internal affairs, the Mexican American head of internal affairs is not going to go easy on you. If you told me that was an actual transcript, I would believe you. Yeah. You yeah, see what I'm saying? Sure. It's because it's very authentic. And if, and to where, if you wanted to defend the movie, you'd say, well, the unrealistic portrayal of cops is like Brooklyn nine, nine. 
yes. where oh, everyone there is woke and friendly and they're not a ball of stress and rage and you know they're all just kind of happy sensitive people whereas this is actually more authentic it's when you know the context of the rest of the movie yes. and who made the movie and how these movies get made and kind of how it's framed to make it look like they're actually correct because it keeps letting them have a voice and you kind of don't hear the rebuttal to it. Otherwise, just taking that scene on its own could be from a movie by Spike Lee, where he's making right. these people saying, look, not only are these cops racist, but the guy who's calling them to the carpet is not actually calling them out on their racism. He's calling them out on getting recorded. Yep. Yeah. And saying, look, I have to suspend you because there's video and there's cameras everywhere these days. You can't act like this anymore. Not because it's evil, <laughs> but because you'll get caught. It's like, yeah, that seems authentic to me. That that based on what we know about a lot of departments, that 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 attitude infuses everything. Like, doesn't it suck that we can't do our jobs anymore, quote unquote, because of these of these cell phone cameras? What the movie does that I think is the trickery, there's a there's a hilarious quote from the director where he says he thinks movies should be less preaching and less messaging. And I just find that funny because there are parts in this movie that I think come to a screeching halt so he can preach something. Yeah. It's uh, the preachiest movie you'll see this yes. year. It, um, it, it, it's not subtle about how it, it has characters just stop and give stilted speeches about things. Yes. Yeah. I really think the key to this movie is the 4060 because I think the way this movie is designed is that it's trying to make you get to a point where when he proposes 4060 and Mel Gibson gets less, you as an audience, the movie is designed for you to think he should have more. That's he, it's unequal. And I think it's he's trying to say stuff about equality and the idea of them weaponizing these videos. Because at the end, he weaponizes a video of Mel Gibson doing something wrong. And they're There's... trying to set up this idea that the uh, the other point is he didn't do anything wrong. Why he didn't do anything wrong? She was going to she killed his it partner. He had to shoot her. Right. Yeah. And so what they're doing is they're setting up this elaborate hypothetical to say, look, it's not always bad it's that thing where like when you make these arguments about cops and people will be like but what if it's like a super duper bad guy and it's like okay but normally it isn't uh normally when they're stepping on someone's head they didn't they like were selling cigarettes on the street right uh, and so it's the the movie creates this hypothetical to justify so that you're outraged at the end when mel gibson is put in this situation where you're thinking why that's he has it wrong he was defending himself against that woman he shouldn't have to split it unequally like he should get both like that i think is the key of this movie is that yeah. It is true that a lot of the moments is like, yeah, they're just racist. They're gritty. They're not portrayed as heroic for being racist, but it sets everything up that by the end, they're trying to make you, they're trying to, uh, you know, make you sympathize with them with this elaborate hypothetical. Yeah. There's related to that in the very first scene that we meet them when they, when they arrest the uh, Latino drug dealer, um, and have uh, a really uh, racistly uh, terrorize his girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. Um, he they they both comment on how nice the guy's apartment is, and it is like objectively, it's a very nice apartment. He's got like a full walk-in closet full of suits, and like Mel says, it's like it's better than the one I live in. And then we see his apartment is indeed just a, a shit pile of bricks. Um, so it's like. Yeah, it's trying to. I really do feel like it's trying to tell us that, like, these drug dealers and and these, we shouldn't feel bad for when cops mistreat criminals because the criminals are living better than the cops, you know. And like, is it a like, man, <laughs> um, is it a coincidence that at the end of the film, um, when uh, Henry walks into his house, uh, this is kind of related to the the thing about the lions where he was like that's some rich white people thing and then at the end he's like let's go hunt some lions the entire house is white he's wearing a white linen suit his brother's dressed all in white and his mom is is on a white massage table covered by a white towel 
Yeah, I don't like, think that can that's, be a coincidence. That's probably not a coincidence, right? <laughs> uh, that, that said, you don't you don't have to go looking for coding and in the set design in this movie it's, no you really don't it's just like if someone feels like that's a reach don't don't worry there's plenty <laughs> there, there's yeah. plenty to unpack we, do, we don't have to go we don't have to go there i i feel like there's okay <laughs> it is hard to know when you watch any movie how much credit to give to the filmmaker like he he may come back and say well that that house is that's my agent's house that's the only location that's the only mansion location sure, we could yeah, get yeah. and that's this is just um it's hard to know what is deliberate and what is not and this guy i feel like plays with that to an extent because there are so many choices here that are extremely intentional this guy is so you know this is writer director producer it's all the same guy the songs on the soundtrack have all been written or co-written by this guy, by S. Craig Zoller. <laughs> and it has like weird. this R&B 70s soundtrack. He wrote those songs. The, the song on the radio they play at the end when they're like towing the car and they like play the song in the entirety in its entirety. The director wrote that song. That's not like a real song that exists. It was made for this movie. So someone with that kind of total control and micromanagement it's hard not to take every choice as being meaningful because clearly he has a worldview he's trying to convey. He doesn't hide that. But in any interview when it's like, well, no, it's just, you know, these are interesting characters and this is the emotional state they're in. I just like to, to still tell stories of, of interesting characters interacting with each other, doing stuff. It's like, man, I don't think that's true. I, like in, <laughs> in, in both ways, yeah. that's not giving himself enough credit. And it's also kind of, trying to avoid the kind of analysis we're doing right now. Yeah. yeah. Th there's also some definite red flags in his interviews. Oh yeah. Um, I, the first one I noticed where he says in the Yahoo interview, I'm pretty open-minded and have an interest in a lot of different things. So it's going to push buttons with people. And I'm like, what is going to put push? What, what, interests in things are going to push buttons with people he says a lot of we like that's a very like oh i'm just open-minded i'm just open to ideas you know i just read from everything i don't not just mainstream media these other websites like it's all it's all very <laughs> coded feeling he talks about in film school um uh, he says i i made a lot of little shorts that people yelled at me for making and doesn't and doesn't like expand and it's like why were they yelling at you <laughs> film students aren't that liberal they like they like tarantino films where people shout the n-word you know like they're not they're not that uh 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 yeah left-leaning traditionally they're they're it's all pretty mixed or centered so like why are you making so many short films that people are yelling at you for making what is that nobody yells at people for making short films if they're bad um, or if they're gory, like film students love that shit. So what were the films? <laughs> what are the ideas that are pushing buttons with people? Like, can you specify? And no, and they never, you know, they never ask him to. It's just, I have a lot of ideas and thoughts that rub people the wrong way. And that's where they leave it. Yeah. And it's like, man, <laughs> he also, yeah, does say there's overlap with me and some of the characters. <laughs> he, he 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 admits to that he goes i think there's some overlap there he admits um, to it but it's always in the process of saying that you shouldn't take their point of view as my point of view it's right. it's a really and i guess we should get into the backstory here because these movies all of this guy's movies so far have been there's a producer named dallas sanye who i guess his whole thing is he shoots i guess the movies are all shot in texas but it's it's a wealthy person who is funding movies and the whole language is for audiences that Hollywood neglects. Yes. You know, and it's because like and it's true, like you don't see there's not like an anti-abortion storyline in Avengers Endgame. Uh, right. you know, it's true that if you're, if you're pro, if you're pro-life or, or whatever, you don't get that many blockbuster movies that, that play to that. Um, so the the moment you say that 
I don't know. I don't want to take like this black and white view of the world, but it's clear that it's coming from a point of view of, well, this is the movie that the Hollywood would be scared to make, which rubs me the wrong way because like, did you guys do an episode on that Netflix movie extraction where Chris Hemsworth beats up those children? Yes, we did. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's a movie that, you know, people talk about like guys like this. will talk about Hollywood is full of, you know, liberal, uh, you know, PC crybabies or whatever. But extraction is that thing where it's a white guy going into a place that's portrayed as the third world. You know, there's one point they have to go into a sewer. It's, it's shown as being filthy and run down mm-hmm. and the people are filthy. And it's like the white guy has to fight his way through wave after wave of these people in this this third world crap hole and they even do that thing where they use that yellow filter on the on the entire movie the the third world you know some people on social media call the piss filter that it's it's (laughs) like this is a, a crap hole you know um so that's a movie that is made, you know, mainstream, big budget, made by the Russo brothers or, or whoever all was involved in that. Yeah, yeah, they were the producers. And no one blinks at it, but that is, in its messaging, is conservative as hell. Like, here's a problem that can oh, only yeah. be solved by a white guy with top of the line weaponry. At the, you know, it's action and, and the shooting and the violence is fun. It's a great way to solve problems. And in places like this, only this guy with this equipment can fix what's wrong and that is a that is not a liberal pc message it is a message that is tacked on to this beautifully shot and staged and choreographed action movie and we just watch it and it just washes over us and it's like nobody even makes a peep except for you know somebody on twitter will point it out but it doesn't matter They, they made their money they all got paid netflix showed it netflix didn't get boycotted so the idea that well you can't make you know, a, a movie in Hollywood, unless it's just, you know, PC propaganda is nonsense to me. It's very funny because I always think whenever people say that, I'm like, oh, you know, you know how like they never have guns in movies. No one ever uses guns in movies or like in Ghostbusters. <laughs> right. The villain is the goddamn EPA or that we have a <laughs> blonde haired, blue eyed Captain America who like exerts control over the world. Like it's 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 like, of course, it's Yeah. <laughs> It's I mean, it's such a silly argument to me. Well, the, that freaking that abominable Death Wish remake came out like oh, a year or two ago. That goodness. is one of the most racist films. Yeah, it, I oh. I get what people will say. Where it's that yeah, <clears throat> there's this there's a a base level liberal ideas that are often in these movies, but a lot of them are like related to human rights as opposed to like like conservative ideas about uh, like. Like uh, uh, the more more ingrained political ideas and stuff like that. So yeah, it, it, that's always a very silly argument to me because it's still just yeah. It's all it's all fairly wealthy people making these movies from that perspective usually. Yeah, there's a there's a a line another line in the Yahoo interview where he says Zoller the director says the script that set me up in Hollywood certainly felt very far left to people it's probably not surprising that that was the one that got me my three picture deal at Warner Brothers right so it seems now is yeah. that is he referring to a movie that got made he's not talking about Bone Tomahawk that yeah it can't be Bone Tomahawk um I don't know if I don't know if that movie ever got made or not he's written a bunch of scripts and actually a few novels. Um, I'm really curious to read one of his novels. I just... Man. I, th- I think he himself does not... I, I think if you hooked him up to a lie detector machine and said, well, are, do you consider yourself to be alt-right or something like that? He'd say no, and I think it would come up that he's telling the truth. I don't think he sees himself that way. I think mm-hmm. he would probably defend this movie to the ends of the earth, saying, well, the only good guy is a black guy. That you know, The villains, yep. the bank robbers, are all bitter racists. And... You know, and all that. I think he's trying of, kind of trying to come at it from a point of view of, well, can you blame these people for being racist? They live in this right. neighborhood where all the black people are constantly attacking them. Wouldn't you also be racist? You're like, oh, okay, back up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you kind of started your thought process one step too far. So this is where I, I guess we need to talk about what is. Probably the most inexcusable part of the movie 
Yeah. Which Mel Gibson's motivation, the inciting incident of the entire plot, the thing that makes him want to go off because he's been suspended, but the whole deal is that he cannot afford this unpaid suspension. Okay, let me back up. That's the second most inexcusable. (laughs) (laughs) The most inexcusable thing is the conversation they have with Don Johnson ends with Don Johnson, their chief or whatever, whoever their superior is saying, well, you've been caught on video. There's definitely no way out of this. I have to give you both a six week unpaid suspension. And that's, that's it. We're making that decision right here in the office. And they both, both just hand over their guns and badges and walk out. And the discipline happens just like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Would it be that, that disciplining police officers for getting caught on video for being, you know, in, in the dark, being too rough with a suspect, uh, who was armed and they had to take a gun off him. If only that's the way it really worked. The yeah. idea that their union would not be in on this discussion, that they would not have a union rep in there with them on this discussion, that all of these steps and appeals, that they would just get a six week unpaid suspension. And then all of their beef about this, all of their complaints about that this drives them to a life of crime is based on this premise that we're too quick and too harsh on our police when they when they're a little too rough in the course of of arresting a guy who is armed you know yeah. and would maybe have shot them or whatever when in real life yeah not not the way it plays out so much yeah no and it's 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 definitely t- telling that this came out in 2018 because it really <sighs> It's 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 weird to to say I guess but it it really the whole impetus for their suspension reminded me a lot of Con Air in that you know like <laughs> Nick, you're Nick, considered a dangerous <laughs> weapon right well yeah and, and We're like he put gets you in jail forever right he gets sent to prison for a maximum security prison for like a decade for uh, killing a guy who tried to stab him and his pregnant wife. Yeah. Um, and in this situation, it's like, yeah, they're rough with the guy, but like, not really that rough. The guy and was not injured at all. He wasn't injured. He had it. He he was armed. He was a dangerous guy who had a, a was a known drug dealer. So it's like they're really trying to. We somebody mentioned earlier about weaponizing the videos against people. They're really trying to get us to feel this injustice about right. it. Right. It's like, oh, they didn't do anything. That was they, a bad guy, was, and they hardly it, heard him. Right. They barely heard him, and then it's well, like they, they just immediately get suspended for six weeks without pay. It's like, no, no, that would it's, that definitely not. I mean, that that wouldn't happen probably right now. Yeah. Even in the midst of of the Black Lives Matter protest, it certainly wouldn't have happened in 2018. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there are I protesters also, who got it worse than the guy in the movie did. Just exactly. in the course, of, yeah. And, the director, and, the director claims that he didn't he didn't have Mel Gibson in mind for this role. I'm going to go ahead and say that he's lying, <laughs> uh, because when you think of it as a larger analogy, because there's a part where Mel Gibson practically looks at the camera and goes like, "I was such a good cop, and I didn't, I didn't, you know, I wasn't." political enough i didn't i didn't get with the time so they cast me out and it feels like mel gibson saying like i st- i'm a good actor i'm a good filmmaker i still have good stuff in me but you won't let me and he's and it's like that complaint of like they've cast me out and he's mm-hmm. saying this in a movie that he's in yeah where it's it's that thing where it's like I, it reminds me of like you know, I, 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 I like a lot of his comedy, but Dave Chappelle has a problem with this where he was be like, you know, they don't let you say anything anymore. People don't let me say what I want to. And it's like you're saying this on a very big Netflix special. On, yeah. On so your I would massive disagree. million yeah. dollar Netflix special. <laughs> yeah. And I, I do. They, I, I think it's that where they're like, you do one little thing and oh, they cast you. And it's like, yeah, we know that doesn't happen with cops Mm -hmm. and they try so hard to make it like at the end where they're like we're on our own and it's like just call your cop friends man yeah (laughs) like i think if they found you at that crime scene at the end with everybody dead i think you'd be fine yeah because you stopped a (laughs) bank robbery yeah and even having shot the woman just saying like oh yeah she came at us with a gun actually this guy's got video look at 
it, it actually shows her with a gun. It, it's, yeah. you know, the, uh, America generally does not rally around the bank robbers in that situation. But right. in the universe of this movie, they're like, yeah, we, we're all alone. It's it's us two cops who can't use our normal methods because we're, we've been suspended unfairly. But anyway, <laughs> he... The the second worst scene <laughs> right. is Mel Gibson comes home from the suspension and it establishes why this is so devastating to him because his wife is disabled, but they show his young teenage daughter and she's got to be, I don't know, 13, something like that, 14. Mm-hmm. She's walking home from school and a gang of young black kids assault her is the the language they use in the movie. Now, the assault is Repeatedly. a guy grabs the guy a guy a guy grabs a soda and splashes her with it. Yeah. yeah. And then she and comes home. A, they call it assault repeatedly also, in the movie. Also, it's it, it needs to be noted that it's a young black kid in a hoodie. Yeah. Um it's just like, "See, look, they're really bad." And he's splashing her with an orange soda. Yeah. yeah. So, she comes home and the entire family is devastated this has happened. Like and he says, this is the fifth time she's been assaulted in two years. <laughs> I would not want anyone to throw a soda on me. Yep. I, it, that's unpleasant. You shouldn't do that. The idea, <laughs> the idea that these black teenagers in this neighborhood would intentionally target this girl because they know she's the daughter of the cop who lives there is absurd yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> that is the one person they would even if they were just constantly throwing soda at people if they had something wrong with them and they just felt compelled to do that all day long that's the one person they would not throw soda on it, because this is the one guy who can get patrols coming by that street every 20 minutes who can find something those kids or their parents are doing wrong they can like he can make their lives hell. Mm-hmm. The idea that you're showing this world where our white children of white police officers cannot go about their day without constantly being victimized by these black teenagers is insane. Yeah. Yes. It is if you completely live in the world. ridiculous. <laughs> and this is one case where the the argument that well he's just can he's just showing police as they often are that they become bitter and racist or or whatever. This is where it kind of falls apart because his whole motivation is that, uh, you know, and, and the wife says in the, the racist speech you guys uh, yeah. mentioned earlier, she's like, I used to be a progressive. I used to be very left wing, but I don't know. Like, I never thought of myself as racist, but seeing these people, I now am racist. And I know for a fact that if we don't get out of this neighborhood, they will rape our daughter. Yep. Yes. And that we will be, it'll be you and I in a hospital room talking to a rape counselor. If you don't get some money together, if you don't, I don't know, steal some gold, if there's some pirate gold, something to steal, get us out of here. And that's the impetus for the entire rest of the movie. It's his daughter getting assaulted by a kid throwing a, a, a soft drink on her. It's really shocking. <laughs> like, yeah, it, uh, I, it, especially with quotes that mel gibson has said about rape Mm -hmm. uh and and the fact that it's mel gibson it just all comes together in this horrifying moment where she says something like i wasn't racist until he moved into this area oh right it's their fault you're racist specifically the fear of a white woman being raped by black men that is the specific thing mel gibson has said now circling back s craig zoller insists stridently that this was written and completed years before Mel Gibson was attached, that he, that he had Vince Vaughn attached because they worked together on brawl and cell block. 99. 99. Um, not had not seen the previous 98 movies in the series. So a lot of that, maybe there's (laughs) context, but, um, I know that's the world's lamest movie joke is to insist that every movie <laughs> a sequel number. I apologize. It's, it's the sports ball of movie jokes, but the, that's fine. The insist <laughs> that it was Vince Vaughn who said you could get Mel Gibson for this. Now, in some ways, that's even funnier because Vince Vaughn reads this is like, you know, who'd be perfect for this. <laughs> <laughs> but S. Craig Zoller even insists that there was it was not changed or revised once Mel came on board. That all of those parallels, I guess, are just coincidence. 
which the, again, the entire reason I wanted to watch this movie is I thought this is Mel Gibson making like this self-aware, almost like the Jean-Claude Van Damme movie where he made it yeah. about himself, but it's like a fictionalized version of, of himself, but it's like very self-aware. And then it's about, you know, somebody realizing that they've become a monster without noticing it and then kind of getting into the trauma that causes it and maybe trying to seek some kind of redemption, or whatever. It's like, oh, I've got it. I've got to see how this this turned out because it's also a Vince Vaughn movie. Like I, I've got a feeling that he did not do this well. If he if he truly just came on board late in the process and they didn't change anything for him, that's like the most fortunate bit of casting because yeah, the entire reason it's like an interesting piece of art is knowing if you didn't know who Mel Gibson was, who was just a nobody. It's not half as I don't know, compelling or whatever, because he does a good job playing this character. Yeah. Of course he does. <laughs> yeah. It's not, he's not having to stretch no. a lot. If anything, he's having to keep a lid on it he's a little bit. Scale, yeah. He's having to scale it back. Yeah. If anything, there are takes where he was like, cut. Okay, Mel, let's uh, avoid improv from here on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did not know he was in a movie, and they just filmed him <laughs> saying some things. Uh, it, it, it's and it's not just that he when he tells because this movie these these cops are constantly making little racist and sexist jokes to each other, which again yeah. is some of the most There's, authentic dialogue because yeah. I've heard those I've heard those jokes I've heard those conversations that's what it sounds like but everything about just someone who is so it, it, the way just the lines on his face and his expressions he is so like done with the world that it is compelling to watch because it's like this guy has no love left in him this is someone who's been out in that world so long that if the movie was not as ham-fisted and ugly in all these other ways, I could see this being like an Oscar performance because it's like, you know, he kind of bared his own ugly soul and then played this hollow shell of a person who could not, like, could not find any humanity in himself and then finally just, just died, like, just dies bleeding out in a car at the end and meets this sad, lonely end, you know, away from his loved ones because he just can't let go of the hate. There could have been quite a movie in that. Yeah. In this mm -hmm. movie, <laughs> where you're, th there's so many moments where they tell a racist joke and it pauses for you to laugh. Like when they're, yeah. when they're harassing the naked girlfriend of the drug dealer, the mm -hmm. Hispanic girlfriend, and she's speaking plain English, and he and Vince Vaughn have this running bit where they act like they can't understand her. Like, can you understand a word she's saying? Not a word. And it's played like a like a comedy beat. Like it ends the scene on like yep. a, like the punchline. Like you are supposed to to laugh at that, and that happens multiple times. Right, and you're supposed to kind of be on their side. Mm -hmm. Like that. I think that's uh that's a this is a, just a problem with cop movies in general, where they do like the like where they like break the rules about the person's rights, but yeah. pretend like they have some workaround, some loophole that's funny, and it's like that's not funny. <laughs> That's a serious problem, uh, and that's what this is. Is she's asking for his lo her lawyer, and they're like, I, d "I don't understand her." And it's like, "Oh, how funny it is that they're refusing her a lawyer." Yeah, yeah. or they for had, racist they reasons. They told her they would let her go if she like told them, gave them the information, whatever. And then they go back yeah. on their and they go back on their word, and it's played as like a is like a joke. And then Mel Gibson says, "Hey, we've." It's like a, they get a duffel bag full of drugs. Like, hey, we've prevented this these drugs from reaching our children. They our repeatedly hit that image, which is an old... Uh, that's like a really old piece of rhetoric about like, oh, these, these guys are... These drugs are going to hit our schools, and they're, he's selling drugs to kids, and it's like a really old shorthand. Right. Because but, it but, justifies anything. Exactly. Yeah. You do in response. Because it's going to poison our precious children. So literally anything you do, which gets back to the whole thing about, you know, like Hollywood is too PC and liberal. I mean, cop movies have been playing, like abusing the suspect's rights for a laugh forever. Yeah. It happens in Die Hard. It happens in like every movie where there's, they joke yeah. about, you know, like, oh, yeah, another complaint for this 
cop. It's. I I think a lot of this is them telling on themselves too with this, because going back to him saying that he doesn't like preachy films, the movie is hurt by a lot of this stuff. Like there's a scene in the diner, that diner scene right after this scene, where it just got, cuts to him at, at a diner and they're listening to music and they go like, "Can you tell if this singer's a man or a woman?" And he's like, "No, nah, I can't." Uh, the lines are so blurred these days ever since men start, started saying we're pregnant and then the movie cuts to a different scene and I was like what was the point of that scene <laughs> yeah like why was that scene in the movie and if you read the interview with the director he goes off on that he he like the, he it's clearly a thing that he believes because they start asking him about it and he says like well as a linguist linguist I think that uh, you know we're being t- we're we're changing lang- language too much and that really bothers me and he goes on and on and it's like really <laughs> telling and yeah as a movie it's like that's just a very unnecessary scene um it I also believe the same with um uh oh shoot what's her name Emily Rose over there uh Oh, Jennifer Uh, Carpenter? uh, Jennifer Carpenter, where, like, they spend, like, three minutes on her, on the, on the conflict of a woman who can't handle working, uh, because she has a baby. Yeah, she can't stand to be away from her baby. And the movie comes to this weird halt, and it's like, I don't, I've never met someone like this, who's begging at her door, I just want to touch my baby, I can't go to work, I can't do this, and it felt like they were, like trying to show the perils of 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 a mother working and i know they were also supposed trying to point out that this like to make it more sympathetic when what happens to her right to make it more horrible yeah but it's just like this doesn't seem like a person that exists like what's wrong with her we should Um, back up because i think the audience probably does not know what in the hell like why are we suddenly talking about a a pregnant woman going to work like who is this this is not one of the characters She comes out of nowhere, like (laughs) 90 minutes into the movie, suddenly you are, there's a woman outside her apartment who her boyfriend or husband is telling her she has to go to work and she's working at this bank and she doesn't want to leave her new baby. And he's like, you have used up all of your maternity leave. You have used up all of your vacation time, sick time. You have to go back to work. We can't afford for you not to go back to work. And she's freaking out because she doesn't want to be away from, from the baby. And he I also says you have the better job, which I think is important for yeah. the message. Uh, right? Yeah, because he can't go back to work. She makes more than makes more than him. Yeah. So it, this comes out of the blue. You don't know why you're watching this scene. It then follows her going back to work in a state of emotional turmoil, and then it turns out she is going to work at the bank that's about to be robbed, and that's where it yeah. intersects with the main plot. But this woman has not been in the movie up to that point. She will not be in the movie after what happens to her. And what happens to her is she arrives at work. Her boss welcomes her back to work. And this very weird comedy bit that goes on for a very long time. Yeah. It, it was. Yeah. I, like he's really her boss is Cy Abelman from a serious man. Yes. Uh, <laughs> he's also been in all of this director's films. Yes, that's true. Yeah. I didn't know that. So yeah. <laughs> then immediately the bank robbers show up, uh, the, the evil sadistic bank robbers, and they go through their, their, this terrifying process of, of tying everyone up. And, and then they ask, she walks over to a computer terminal and one of her coworkers has typed out an email that he's going to send alerting someone to call the cops that were being robbed. Yeah. And she, like, reaches down to try to stop him from sending it because the robbers have said, if the cops show up, everybody here dies. The robber then shoots his machine gun and blows both of her hands off. She reaches into her pocket and pulls out, like, this knitted booty and says, can you please give this to my baby? Yeah. And the robber fires his machine gun and her head explodes in a cartoonish <laughs> manner that it's completely gone. It, and then cut away. She's not out of the movie. Yeah. Yep. And I think that's like we talked about how this is a good director. I think that is a bad filmmaking choice from beginning <laughs> to end because I think he was trying to get messages out that were in his brain. Yeah. That whether or not he knew it, 
He wanted to show a working woman who makes all the money fall apart because she had a kid and then get punished for it. And her last thoughts be her kid. The idea of this was all for nothing. I should have been with my kid. Um, And so it's so like her everything the way she acts her last thing of taking out that booty that like was, that's not I the last when yeah. that happened. it's played that's not what as you'd... comedy it's played as slapstick comedy yeah. like she wouldn't accept her death at that point she would say please stop no yeah like if the point of the character was to make us hate the robbers by showing a person going into work, just, you know, stopping. Like, I like that choice. But if they made the things that this woman, like if she had suffered some sort of trauma in her life and was having trouble going back to work mm-hmm. and then this happens to her, that and, and you know, like it was the weird tie-in with family and, and motherhood that seemed really ham-fisted and weird that I was just like, what was that? What, what was that character? And you don't you don't end the sequence feeling what I think he wanted you to feel, uh, because he was too distracted by this other thing. Mm-hmm. And I guess it we. Ki- oh, go on. Well, I guess we should just point out here: this is a deeply weird movie. <laughs> yeah, it's weird in a lot of ways. It's, it's, yeah. it, it, there's all sorts of things. Like that's part of what makes it compelling to watch. It is. Like there's no score; it's dead silence. The the only music you hear is when there's a, a radio and it's playing a song from the filmmaker. <laughs> One of the director's soul jams. Yeah, the, he, has, he wrote, yeah, the, he wrote and then gave to you know, like an R and B group or whatever to to sing. But the movie is like two hours and forty minutes long, something like that. The first action occurs at like ninety minutes in. I think it's when that woman gets her head blown off. Everything up to that point has been just slow boil we do the, see two we do see the one maniac do two robberies yeah but they're not action like, like you, you see no, him do no. it but there's not like an action sequence it's not like an action set piece he kind of just comes in and does it to establish that these guys are sadistic yeah. uh, monsters which is there to justify that see compared to the bad guys our racist cops are not as bad as them yeah i also didn't understand i thought they were like framing someone or something because he's doing low-level robberies uh, to then buy a van. To yeah, buy, he, yeah, the, right? the sweet yeah. ass van. Yeah, yeah, he's robbing like convenience stores like 30 bucks at a time so and, like, they can rent this car. armored van. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot it's, of weird choices like that. <laughs> yeah. the, and then he like sense. shoots up the convenience store. That's when I thought like, oh, he's trying to make it look like a petty crime, but he's like a high level criminal. I thought it was some like intrigue there. But no, he like, like shoots a rack of potato chips. Yeah, mm-hmm. with his machine shoots, gun, but it's seemingly the TV. just to just to amuse himself. It's it, this movie has its own slang, like Vince Vaughn anchovies. instead of cursing says anchovies, or they mm-hmm. multiple char- characters when they talk about somebody being tough, they'll say they they threw cast iron. You threw cast yeah. iron at him. They, it's, he keeps it, telling his mom to f- rewind and fast forward or yeah, whatever. Yeah, do it, do it and fast forward. Talking yeah. about yesterday's. Yeah, there's uh, so it, everything about it is quirky and off. The fact that it takes place in a fictional, completely fictional big city instead of just setting it in in New York or whatever. Yeah, it's yeah. Everything about the movie is just a little bit off. There's a scene that I truly do not understand where when the bad guys are driving out to the junkyard or whatever that lot is, the storage mm-hmm. facility, whatever it is, to where they're going to get their getaway car. And there, he's driving down this road, and he like names. He says like "dead rat," "refrigerator," "possum." And I thought he was naming out like markers, like here's where our turn is, because they told us it's by the refrigerator, or whatever. And then when Vince Vaughn is following them, he does the same thing. He says yeah. "dead rat," "refrigerator," "dead possum," or something like that. Yeah, I don't know what I don't know what they're doing. I th- thought. It, they were calling out landmarks to remember to make their way back. That's how like I took how it. How to get back out of there? I don't. Yeah, but it, it also appeared to be a straight road, so I don't know. 
It's or it, may, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it seemed like the, a reference to something that didn't make it into the movie, like that they were they overheard someone giving directions and they were both trying to follow the directions, but they left out the part. Or I just missed it. I, I've seen the movie twice. I I, uh, I just remembered because we were talking about the sadistic robbers in the scene where he robs the two guys in their car. He says to the Hispanic guy, "You do it in five seconds, or or else you'll be painting houses in heaven, or something like that." Yes, like some kind of racist shit. And then after he shoots them both, he puts a sombrero on the Hispanic guy. Yep. Yeah. And then the scene ends. Yep. And he does. He this does that later. Yeah. To rob two guys of what they've got in their pockets. So again, he's he's collecting money like. Eleven dollars at a time. Right, those guys maybe had yeah, like twelve bucks, so that he can get enough money together to rent this van. It's yeah. very, it's very strange to, to rent this GI Joe battle van. Like it's, I think it's, it's almost like painting petty crimes as more insidious acts than desperate acts. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's the intention. I think he just thought it was interesting that that's how this guy's getting his money. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I, but it's very weird from a writing point of view. He wanted to establish how dangerous these guys right. are. And also there's no action beats otherwise. So I think yeah. it's like, well, why would they be committing crimes? Like, well, maybe they need to commit crimes to get the stuff they need. But it's like, I don't know, maybe maybe have them do a heist to get that that battle van. Like it had been very yeah. expensive to win that. It, like, so they have to break into a storage facility and shoot out, have a shootout with some security guards, something. And, and then you get your action beat and you see how, like maybe they torture the guys they stole the van from something like that, rather than rob a convenience yes. store for the $25. To, it's, 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 it's weird. It's one of a lot of weird, weird choices. Um, later on, <laughs> Because the movie, it, it, the movie again is quiet for the first ninety minutes, and then just descends into hell at, at, for the, like right. the last hour or whatever. <laughs> like it just, it's, it's, it's quiet for ninety minutes, and then Jennifer Carpenter's head completely explodes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so one of the there's there's Henry, and then his his the reason we, for the listeners the reason we don't know the name of his partner is everyone just refers to him as various, like the racist hijackers. They call him Muscles or something muscles, like that. Muscles, yeah. yeah. Like we don't hear his name because they're, they're never using it really they're, because they're, they don't, they're not interested in knowing their names. They like call Henry Slim or something like that. And the yeah. other guy Muscles and, and it's very derisive. And, um, but he gets killed first and swallows a key. He's trying to thwart the robbery at this point. So they've, they've got their getaway vehicle locked up. And so he swallows the key to get their getaway vehicle out. Cause he wants to screw them over because they're monsters. Mm-hmm. So to get the key out, they have to drag his corpse into their battle van, cut it open and pull his stomach out and cut the stomach open to get the key out of it. And one of the other robbers, one of the other racist robbers says, don't pierce his liver the inside of a black person's liver smells bad. Right? Yeah. That's not a stereotype I had ever heard before. <laughs> yeah, it's like they're introducing new ones. It's not one I was aware of, no. Um, so, yeah. Uh, that's dragged across concrete. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a lot of... I don't know. It, yeah, the the stuff like that where he's just adding like arbitrarily racist characters well is he, like I, yeah he also portrays some of the people of color in the movie like apart from henry and his friend like he sort of portrays them as being like treacherous like like right for, this this really stuck out to me there's a whole plot line involving vince vaughn has gotten a ring to propose to his girlfriend who is black um and he like that we like their relationship is very tense and then at the end of the like because he doesn't tell her what he's up to um and she's sort of grilling him about it and he's kind of like you know he, he has to pretend that he's not doing it so it, towards the end he like has her because he, he's he's not sure whether or not they're going to get killed so he has her go to his house to check in his pocket for oh something i need and it's he wants her to find the ring so that she can give him his answer and then she she calls him he doesn't answer the phone because they're in the middle of a shootout. He gets killed. And as he's dying, he listens to the voicemail message and it's clear that she said no. And he's like, oh, it wasn't the answer I wanted. Whereas 
Mel Gibson's wife, who is Lori Holden, who is blonde hair and blue eyed, um, is just completely ride or die without question for every step of this. Yeah. And I don't know well, if that was intentional. I think it's part of the dog whistling, which is that it's the it's the deniability. It's the because I know in the interview he's like, see, the Vince Vaughn character is a little more progressive because he has a wife well, who's he, black because he's a black but girlfriend. Then it's like, <laughs> but how did that work out for him? Yeah, um, it's it's. I think it's the difference between it's the again, it's the the deniability is like the movie's not racist; these characters are racist. But then when you look at what happens to them, it's the same mm. with that Puppet Master film, which I, I haven't watched, but reading we, reviews. We, we kind of have to watch it, don't we? Yeah, because <laughs> what they're talking about is like, of course, the Nazi puppets are the villains, uh, but it's a slasher film. And in the movie, they kill only like LGBTQ people and minorities and Jewish people. Oh, and dear. so if you know anything about slasher movies... There's a reason why they kill annoying teens because you're there to watch the kills. It's it's watching elaborate kills of people that are stereotypes or like people or like like stereotypes of dumb teens that you don't like. Yeah. Jason Voorhees is the hero in a way. Yeah. So it's that where they're like, well, the Nazis are the villains. It's like, yes, but it's a movie of just watching stereotypes of like of, of of gay people and black people and stuff get murdered so like there's the deniability but there's the context where it's like if you know anything about slasher films you know that this is mm-hmm. these are supposed to be fun deaths and the, uh and like to revel in that yeah the other instance that i wanted to point out is the person the co-worker that essentially gets jennifer carpenter killed is a person of color right um and it's like i mean it winds up like they kill everybody anyway because <laughs> they're maniacs right. but like they really like they really make you angry at this guy in the in the three seconds that he's in the movie and it winds up just in her getting just cartoonishly executed right um and i'm again it's another one of those things like is that in was that intentional i don't know Everything. it's hard to say that's ninety percent of the movie can be defended if you choose the most charitable reading of it, right? Yes. Because the way what he said in interviews is that well, you hear Mel Gibson or you hear Vince Vaughn's character say racist things when he's with Mel Gibson, but then you see him go home to his black girlfriend. So you have to wonder, like, is he just going along with? If that's the movie you wanted to make. If you wanted to make that movie about how this stuff is passed down from one generation of cops to the next, because in the script he said Vince Vaughn's character is supposed to be much younger, it's supposed to be like you know like a father son dynamic, and in reality right. they they seem you know much closer in age or whatever. They're very uh, yeah, like they keep saying he's twenty years younger than you, and I'm like I don't think that's accurate. Um, but <laughs> but it's supposed to be like a kid, but of course it's you know he, he if you get if you can get Vince Vaughn in your movie instead of some nobody, you're, you're going to do it. But anyway. And the, he was trying to make some point about you shouldn't lump the two cops together. The Mel Gibson is a racist, and then the young guy is just not in a position to question him or whatever. But that's really not in the movie. It's yeah. you don't. You know, he's being just as glib about how these people are treated as Mel Gibson's character is. It, it's you know so. Uh, it, it's one of those things where if you want to. Because I could see people being annoyed that we're like going into interviews with the director and stuff like that and, and seeing how it colors the movie. But watch the movie or don't. But if you watch the movie, <laughs> it, it I personally feel like a lot of what's in there is him sort of trolling the audience a little bit. That it's kind of like you're using the racism to be provocative as like flavor. Which I think that's the criticism of the way Quentin Tarantino uses racial slurs. And it's yes. like, it's because you could, in Pulp Fiction, we had, he has his own character use racial slurs in front of Samuel L. Jackson, and then it cuts away and shows that his wife is black. You know, I think a, a charitable reading of that would be saying, well, but this guy, yeah, he talks like that because he considers himself to be like an honorary black person because he's, he's dating, you know, a black woman or married to a black woman. And then it creates dramatic tension with Samuel, with Jules, 
because he normally would never tolerate this, but he's forced to in that situation because he needs Jimmy to bail them out. Like they're, they're screwed right. otherwise. All of that can be defended, but it's throughout his movies, you get the impression he puts it in because it's like adds grit or flavor because you don't normally hear racial slurs. And so you hear it and it's striking. So it's like, this is language you will find shocking. And so you're using that as like an aesthetic. Yes. And so I it's think, also. No, go ahead. Just. Oh, the re- the reminder is also this is all like the idea of like, it's OK because he's got a black wife. It's like, yeah, but you wrote all of this. <laughs> <laughs> like, right. I, I, I see that a lot where people are like, how else could have this been resolved in the movie? I mean, it had no other choice. It's like, but it's all make believe. They can do whatever they want. <laughs> right. And if you yeah. actually wanted that in the movie showing like what's his wife's relationship to Mel Gibson like? What is Mel Gibson's character? And I apologize again. I'm calling the character Mel Gibson. I do right. not remember the character's name. It, it, oh, he's one Edgman, of those actors where it's it's like Riggleman or something. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, Edgeman or yeah, it's something like that. It's, 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 it's a like a Vakeman name name that yeah. you hear once in the movie. Anyway, if you wanted to dig into that into that dynamic, like, did he approve of that relationship? Is is how does she is she approve of him? Does she approve of the way the two of them police? Why is she okay with it? You could probably make an interesting movie about that. Yeah, someone else could probably make an interesting <laughs> right. movie about that. I don't think that this filmmaker is interested in that. So it's one of those things where he put those elements in the movie, but didn't explore them. Right. And I think that brings us back to because I said earlier on that the real protagonist, like the twist the movie pulls, that the real protagonist is Henry. It's the first character you see. It's the mm-hmm. last guy left alive. He's the only person who acts with any kind of a moral center throughout the entire film but we do not follow him he's not the main character so why not like the sheer fact that mel gibson and vince vaughn are the main characters of the movie and that it's told from their point of view Mm -hmm. automatically biases you to their so why do they need to be in the movie at all why can't it just be about these two guys who get roped into this heist you know, as drivers, not knowing what they're getting into. And then once they see what's really going on, they've got to try to, to take it down from the inside. Like just follow that story. That that's amazing. Yeah. yeah uh, that, that would have been a way better movie. <laughs> it's a uh, man. I just, re- I just recalled the, uh, because the Vince Vaughn, Mel Gibson thing just reminded me of the Onion article, uh, good cop, bad cop, both racist. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Which, yeah. Um, Yeah, that's the big thing is that I also think they're trying to say something about class versus equality with the end because the let's go hunt some lions. Like, he he is definitely the protagonist in the sense, in the definition of a protagonist is like the person who has the arc versus the antagonist the person who causes the arc um and like his protagonist is basically he goes from once he's rich he's gonna do old white guy stuff he's it's the idea of like he's gonna keep going he's gonna keep like let's hunt some lions it's like i'm not done Mm. as opposed to mel gibson's family who is just like thankful to get the money uh we should well we should talk about like the very final scene isn't it mel gibson's wife receiving a box in the mail and it's full the, of gold bars mm-hmm. yeah well the final scene is the let's it's hunt some lions. House. yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah. but some that's reason- the scene right before it because he basically goes and mails them the gold and then he, they show him coming in and he's he, like yeah I he did it. mails them gold <laughs> yeah yeah, because they're because it. And again, I know that of all the things wrong with this movie, getting the weight of gold wrong is not really one of the top sins. Mm-hmm. But it, it's the the teenage daughter is brings in like this box from the mail for her disabled mother, um, and she's like, "Oh, you got a box," and it she opens it and it's it's completely it's like a shoebox size box, completely full of solid gold bars. Yeah. So you can go look up the weight of gold. That box would weigh. Like 150 pounds, <laughs> like, like the teenage, the teenage daughter would not just be hauling it in with one hand, like she's carrying a, a pizza. Uh, but the other question, I think every person in the listenership should ask themselves, if someone gave you a giant box of gold bars, would you know how to spend it? 
<laughs> right. <laughs> Where do you, t- like, if you go to Taco Bell and try to pay in a gold bar, they're just going to look at you. That's not currency. Yeah. You, I think, man, you have to, like, you have to, like, have a gold guy, I guess. But you definitely have to melt it down because yeah, they're, they're going to be first. looking for those it's stolen gold, gold it's bars. stolen gold bullion. Like, it's marked, it, it's yeah. marked currency it's on, mean, in the form of gold bars. Like, how do you... Don't get me wrong. I would certainly Google it and give it right. a shot. <laughs> I guess, but I, I would think I would give up really fast. It's like yeah. they're tracking this, the, and I'm I'm not smart enough. That, uh, like you would have to, it would have to go out of the country. It'd have to get laundered. Like you would have to commit several felonies just yeah. to clean the money, even if the no matter where it came from. If you you just if you know, I don't know. I always love that because I think that the movie. Um, what was the, the movie took place in the Iraq War with Ice Cube and uh, was Three, it Kings. Three Kings? Yeah, yeah. And the yeah you know, the the inspirational ending is they give out gold bars to the the poor Iraqi villagers. Yeah, what the fuck are they going to do with it? Like, what yeah. are they going to do? They're like they're in this <laughs> bombed out country with no infrastructure now. Everything's been destroyed. They have a vacuum at the head of the government, and you've given this poor widow a solid gold bar that weighs 60 pounds <laughs> what am i gonna she, do with this man she's gonna <laughs> trade it yeah. for like a cow or something she she's not, like she's not gonna get the the whatever you know three hundred thousand dollars that that bar is worth it, it, it at that time it's you would have if no anything, idea what to do with it yeah if anything it's them getting the bar and be like oh i look forward to getting shot and this stolen off of me yeah because the like, moment i try to trade it they're just going to take it and realize, yeah uh, i'm sorry it's I, it's well it's the same with the it's a wife of a cop getting this thing of gold and it's like i guess i have to call the cops like what else would you do it's like someone just mailed me a bunch of gold that i can't do anything with maybe there's a reward and unless like, what she, else can you do unless it's she like commits here. several crimes unless she yeah. somehow knows like through her being a she was a former cop, cop herself until her her illness took her out of the job but like oh yeah i know a fence that can move gold it's like right. okay so now you're a criminal because you've you, you've got to launder that money like you your taxes you suddenly came up with you know whatever i don't know how much a box of gold is worth it's got to be millions You've got to account for that on your taxes. You you know yeah. the IRS is going to care that suddenly you you live in a a giant solid gold mansion. <laughs> Somebody's going to notice. Yeah. Uh, but at the movie at the movie she's like weeping in in uh, gratitude. It's like yes, thank you. Like all right, <laughs> I think feels like this is just the beginning of your problems because you're going right. to get yourself involved with some very scummy people. Yeah, uh, it's like just giving her work to do. Uh, also, I wouldn't immediately think it was gold. I'd be like, what is this? Why is someone <sighs> yeah. messing with Surely right it now? can't be gold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, is this a prank? <laughs> uh, the gold that my... So so my husband was killed in... Well, now, hold on. Does she know that he was killed in the course of thwarting this gold heist? I think she just knows he vanished. Yeah, right? they just know that he's disappeared. She probably suspects that he might be dead. Yeah, but um, they they don't know because the daughter's like I think it's from dad. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He's still just buried in a field somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, and so she receives a giant box of gold, and then now everything is fine again because they can finally move out of their neighborhood full of bad black people. So that's the ultimate right. happy ending, because she. It does the solution to her being racist is you finally will have the move the money to move to a white neighborhood right you can, you can right. move away from all the black people ah solve uh, my racism <laughs> i yeah so i the, think that's i think that's a yeah <laughs> it's i think the central i think the central message the underlying message that's very very problematic is the it's the class versus race thing too which is that like money solves everything or equalizes these people. Um, but um, see, it doesn't because the very, very first scene where you have, or I guess the second scene, the first scene is Henry having sex with a woman and then her telling him that she found him attractive when they were both in elementary school. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the second scene, that's the, that's your introduction to this movie. <laughs> that's yeah. the, first, yeah. the first words you hear. 
uh, and then he he points out that he wouldn't have known how to have sex back then. The second mm. scene is him <laughs> going and finding his his mother and point he says, and she's uh, having to she has become a prostitute herself. So the first two women you meet are having sex for money. Right. Um, And he says, why are you having to do this? I have sent you enough money to get through three times over is the way he uses it. And she says, well, the money's gone. It ran out. And he looks at her arms and sees the needle checks and says, well, I can I can see, you know, I can see the steps that left behind or some something very poetic. like that. So here she got enough money to get by and see she just wasted it. Right. So certain later, people, she seems like she's not right, addicted getting to getting all that money. Anymore. Yeah, really flushed the heroin addiction out of her at the end of the movie. Yeah, it was there was a certain amount of money she had to get. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the the money he sent her that was that was the heroin level. But then when you get a lot of money, uh, that that cures it. I believe. Mm-hmm. No, that's science. Yeah. <laughs> that's scientific but yeah i i I don't know the 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 60 40 thing is what i really focused on the idea of i think i think this director doesn't think he's a white supremacist but i think if you asked him because there's a scene where mel gibson talks about the media and he's like yeah the tolerant is they're they're handling intolerance with more intolerance i think if you ask this director he'd be like oh it's gone too far you see racism isn't as much of a problem as the media is making it out to be and now the tables are turning it's becoming in balance it's it's the yeah. it's it's the thing where it's like oh games video games have gone too far because they have a black character where it's like a little like the inches towards equality is is i think this director is now because it's again 60 40 and he uses the leverage is a, a a video where it's like i will expose you for 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 in this case it's not racism it's just bad police work in order to get more than you i'm using my social power against you to leverage more and in the end he ends up in a big house and his wife mel gibson's wife gets scraps and i think that's the big context is the idea that uh this director thinks that racism inequality isn't as big of a deal and it's leading to another form of inequality which is the when you keep going down that when you google it and you keep going down that path you end up on you know the daily stormer and they're talking about white genocide and stuff like that yeah and and it's actually openly stated where mel gibson says because when he's he's trying to sell vince vaughn on doing this heist he's like you know do you feel like we have been fairly compensated for the work we do it's like it's like no right. we're, we're underpaid you know and they don johnson's character earlier says like i know how how crap your pay is even though that's a pretty decent job detective longtime detective you've got a union like that's benefits like that's actually pretty pretty decent pay like if you looked at all the city's employees i'm gonna bet that a guy who's been a detective for 30 years is actually that's a pretty sweet deal it's probably yeah. doing okay but they say and then they, when you show how well like the drug dealers live and then in the end you know the guy who's truly wealthy makes his money it's stolen gold it's not his it, it, he seems to be saying the the thing that's broken about society is that the hero cops are not getting paid very much and they're having to live in bad neighborhoods and this makes them cranky and then everyone's too hard on them and meanwhile the criminals uh, get away with with murder, and they get to you know live in nice apartments and by selling poison to to kids. Yeah. Now, you do not have to be a Nazi to believe that. That is that is the core belief of many 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 crime movies. That is the core belief of CSI and all of the other eight hundred crime procedurals on TV. Mainstream America, I think maybe a majority of Americans, maybe fifty five percent of Americans believe that that's wrong, what's wrong with society that 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 the the lazy uh low moral people make money and that the hard working that the brave troops and the cops uh get cramped on and they're out there putting their lives on the line da, 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 and they they don't you know they don't get any credit so believing that doesn't 
itself does not make you a white supremacist. I, I think, you know, yes. the listeners know there's not just two types of people in America, good people and, and Nazis. There's a whole spectrum. Right. And a lot of people in the middle here, this strikes me more of a guy wading into these issues who himself does not have a super nuanced view of it. Like, like this is not the filmmaker to make this movie in this year. You know, because, again, 2018 was years after Ferguson and, and you know, the, all of the Black Lives Matter movement is right in the heart of that. To make a movie that's making a statement about that, and it kind of comes at it from this point of view, strikes me more of someone who's ignorant of the actual issues. For instance, the fact that he clearly does not understand what procedure looks like when a cop gets suspended. Yeah. That in reality, yeah. there's appeals in reality. They more often than not are going to get it overturned or reduced or that it's with pay, that it's administrative leave with pay. Th the fact that he wades into this and makes it a core point of this movie to the point where he's preaching about it, but does not understand it is as damning as trying to say, well, maybe he's secretly an alt-right or whatever. I think what happens is there's a pipeline of people who don't, especially teenagers, who don't understand these things likewise. And then because they don't understand these things, they are easily drawn into because if you truly thought that this is the way it worked, that cops make minimum wage, that they're constantly in danger, that the criminals are all rich psychopaths and that, you know, any, any piece of video getting taken out of context can just ruin their life. If you actually think that's what it is going on. Yeah. You would have a certain point of view about it. But it's yes. not like like it's a disagreement about fact. This is not what it looks like when someone records you for 30 seconds standing on a suspect. You just took a gun off of who was suffered no injuries and was fine. No, you don't get a six week unpaid suspension with no opportunity for appeal or a union rep or anything like that. Like, no, that's that's literally not how yeah. it works. It's built on a bad foundation, which is why it reminds me of people like Ben Shapiro, where, where you go into his arguments and he'll state a fact and then he'll keep going and he'll build off that and build off that. And like it's like a study or something. Or, or he'll, and then you or click he'll on say, the study. Or he'll say, you, let's just say this for instance. Right, right. Um, and then you click on it. You look at the thing he's building off of and you're like, wait, that's wrong. <laughs> like that's factually wrong the study is inaccurate or like it wasn't it didn't say that or like the sample size was weird or like it has been denounced um and but he's it's building completely off that so it starts from that point of view and that's how it can really mislead people because again it's presenting a hypothetical and then getting you to by the end you're like well yeah that isn't fair Oh, yeah, they, no, it shouldn't be because Mel Gibson also does all the work, you know, he's the one shooting up the van. And so it's it's that where they just uh, take you on this journey to make you be like, oh, this poor guy who died trying to protect his family while this other guy who was trying to do the same thing, but was a criminal uh, thrives. And so it, it just it takes you down this road that started from a false uh, idea to begin with. Yeah. And and so like the movie can hold together for that reason for the most part until you kind of stand back from it. And then I also think it's like you said, Jason, like it's not the general idea is something that a lot of Americans share, um, but it's like almost using that against it. And then you stand back and you look at this guy's entire filmography and you're like, what is going on here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and his claim that I'm not pushing any one worldview, uh, he may even think that, yeah. but it's hard to buy it because, f for example, like we talked about how Hollywood loves guns. And so to act like, you know, the, the Hollywood's just pushing the Democratic Party platform, you know, it, like the John Wick movies are not as good in, in a movie that has strict gun control laws. <laughs> right. But that movie, there's no character in John Wick who sits down and says, man, you know, you could have saved your, your wife, but 
it's so hard to get a gun these days because of the liberals. It would be a completely different movie if, if characters (laughs) stopped and lamented that, you know, well, you know, these days, you know, there was a time when you could just shoot 75 guys if you needed to. And now with these, you know, the background checks, you know, John, you're not going to pass that background check and the magazine limits that, that, the that the governor passed. You don't get that in those movies. Those movies established from the first frame, they do not take place in our universe. Everything about that world is ridiculous. The way the police work, everything about it, it's almost like magical realism. It, it's it's like a kung fu movie where everyone in the universe knows kung fu. Mm-hmm. Like where you can get into a fight at a grocery store and all the people stocking the shelves are using kung fu to fight you. It's like that. You don't. No one thinks that movie is about the dangers of everyone learning kung fu. It's like no, this takes place in in kung fu universe. Drank the cross across country really stops the movie to talk about our society and what yes. and what this means and what it pertains to it. And that's our beef because I could see if you've not seen the movie, it may seem ridiculous that I say, well, they're the way they portray police procedure is inaccurate because, of course, what cop movie is is accurate. They you know none of them get it right. But you have to understand it's a key plot point and it's very preachy about it. And about a thing yeah. that's just that is just not true. It, it's unfair in the way that Jaws is unfair to sharks. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. well, you know, these sharks, if, if you don't kill them, they'll just jump right into your boat <laughs> and bite you. It's like, no, they really, they really not won't do that. It's anyway. It, yeah, it stacks, it's, uh, it stacks the deck, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, and we we started this by saying he's a good filmmaker. I would argue he's a terrible writer for this reason. I did. I, I've talked about this on a few podcasts. Um, it's just that whenever someone's injecting a belief in whether or not they know it, it, it fails. Um, the, the first time I noticed it and was talking about it is we, uh, we watched twilight for a podcast and the author clearly is, is uh, Mormon and there's nothing wrong with that, but they kind of, are injecting those beliefs into a story about vampire romance. And those two things kind of don't work where it's like Edward wants to wait till marriage to have sex with Bella. And it's like, they're competing. You're a child of Satan. (laughs) Yeah. Like you're a vampire. I don't know why you care about that. And it's stuff like that where it's like when, when the movie comes to a halt because the director or writer has something to say. And sometimes I don't think like the writer of twilight even realized it. Um, it's why I think, um, uh, uh, Christian films are like kind of their own genre and are tend to be known as being bad because the, the, it's, it's not tell a story first. It's tell a specific message first. Yeah. And like movies can put messages in them all the time, but the moment you like put that, I think you make that more important, it starts falling apart and it has nothing to do with what the message is. It could be a positive message. It could be a negative one. And this one feels like he's definitely preaching and it, the movie keeps just hurting because of it. And ultimately, even though he's a good director, he's making a bad movie and uh, that is nonsense at times. I feel like this is, and I, I realize I, I've made your episode run long already. Yeah, that's sure. Fine. <laughs> this is an important point because this is something that's at the core of what we do for a living. Mm-hmm. I hear it cracked when we write articles or do podcasts talking about problematic content in a movie or something that's sexist or racist or whatever. The goal, at least for me, is not to rid the world of of problematic movies because that is how you wind up with the equivalent of Christian movies or Christian rock where the only art that can exist is like promoting good moral values. And it just tends to be bad art. It's not saying that you need racism to make movies good. (laughs) It's saying that you need art to have the freedom to go where it's going to go. And then if what you wind up with is problematic, my goal is to have an audience that is capable of watching it and processing it and saying, oh, that's a bad message. 
I, I don't want to rid the world of it because I don't think you can. Our whole goal or my whole goal at Cracked and writing these articles and examining these movies is so that you can watch a movie if you just want to let it wash over you, but that you also have the tools, the critical thinking tools to say, okay, well, what, what worldview does this movie or this TV show want me to buy into? Mm-hmm. And that's it. So I don't. We're not trying to cancel this movie. I I, no. I think it was worth watching, and I think understanding where this guy's coming from is important because he's not the only person who thinks like this. Yes, um, I do think. Yeah, like especially at cracked. It was a lot of it was for the sake of comedy because it was movies like Back to the Future and movies that I grew up loving, where it's like when you step back, isn't this kind of messed up? Yeah, yeah. And uh, like, I think, and it's like. It, most of the time, it's that. In this case, personally, I think I'm done with this guy's movies. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I'm I'm pretty sure this guy is uh, has some white supremacist leanings at least. And I'm like, yeah, it's it's his next movie is with Park Chan Wook, which is the director of Old Boy, which is Ooh. one of my favorite movies. And I'm I'm very bummed out about that. Yeah, I don't know because my. I, I I mentioned earlier on that, that like my weakness is stuff like this where it promises to be just a nightmare. Well, it, like it's going to be interesting yeah. in a way, you know, because I, I joke that it, the movie made me a worse human being. You know, yeah. I'm somebody who watches a lot of horror, obviously, in the era of streaming. I mean, the num the sheer number of movies I watch. It has to be mind-boggling compared to in the past when you actually used to have to go to Blockbuster and rent something. Then now that I can just just continually just every horror movie that somebody shot on their BlackBerry and the, <laughs> that gets dumped to to uh, Hulu or whatever, I could just pop it up on the screen. So I, in that atmosphere, when you can watch a million movies and like that movie we mentioned earlier, Extraction, that I don't remember a single scene from that movie. It, yeah. it just washed up. It I, was, remember him, I remember him beating up the kids. Beating up children. That's the only thing that, can, yeah. that comes to mind. <laughs> but it's it's extremely, it's bolt solid, beautifully edited, sound designed. You know, everything's choreographed well. It is a bolt solid, perfectly functional movie that I forgot five minutes after after I, <laughs> I watched it. Yeah. Dragged Across Concrete, I've not stopped thinking about it since I saw it. And you can say, well, yeah, well, that's because it was made by what might be a, a horrible person. And that's true, but my thing is I will probably always consume the art because I want to be aware of it. Now, it is 100% defensible and sensible to say, but if you are using your dollar to fund this person's movies, you're basically saying, hey, I want more stuff like this. And I get it. The same thing is you know, going to see a, a Woody Allen movie where it's it's like you're continuing to reward. You're, the message you're sending to Hollywood is, yeah, let this guy keep working because we don't care. I get it. It's just mm-hmm. for me, the only reason I don't watch Woody Allen movies is because I think they're just boring and unfunny. And I, I just <laughs> think he's awful. It has nothing to do with his character. And I'm the guy that when these people, you know, if there's another Mel Gibson movie, I'll probably watch it too, just because I, my curiosity, I justify it by saying, well, it's my job. It's my job to comment on pop culture. So I can't be blind to anything that gets made, even no matter how terrible it is. But ultimately I will admit it's the same reason I follow OJ Simpson on Twitter. Like I'm waiting to see how this goes off the rails and I just right. can't, I can't look away yeah. that that is, that's on me. I don't I'm, I'm not telling anyone else to live this way. I'm not saying it's right. It's just that's my thing. I'll, I'll probably watch his next movie just to see how his style melds with, you know, with, with that guy. It's um, I, I had no idea that it was was coming. Uh, I don't it's know. very difficult. I know. I understand the conflict because like I always had this with um, a director like Roman Polanski, who I can't support because it's one of those things where it's like why why are people still allowing him to, to make movies it's weird um he's a great director he makes interesting films but it, it it's it's the drawing the line thing and i get the also because we uh, we do this with we just watch where there's just movies we watch um that normally i wouldn't watch um so it is part of the job and it is wanting to like always kind of have 
it on your tool belt, this knowledge. I do think that's a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, this was on HBO Max, which helped. Yeah. Well, yeah, we uh, did not have to pay anyone. I, I assume that, that they're not like sending Mel Gibson a check every time somebody streams the the movie on HBO right. Max. He got he got paid. And, you know, that's uh, in this movie. I don't think it was successful. It, it got dumped direct to streaming. I didn't remember hearing any buzz about it. Um, yeah. but it's, uh, I don't know. I, I do. I like the idea of making movies outside of, of Hollywood. I do think there's a sameness, you know, and, and if he's, if it's true, there's certain yeah. movies that can't get made. You know, my brain shouldn't automatically go to Nazi movies. <laughs> there, there surely right. are other movies in Hollywood because Hollywood, as much as it claims to be progressive is actually very prudish about a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and sure. about, yeah. you know, and Disney, will include now like a gay character in the distant background of yeah if you squint like yeah. see uh, see yeah uh you know so if there was someone saying why well, i i won't work with disney for that reason and i want to make movies outside of hollywood you could be using the same language but it's kind of the same thing where if you see a pickup truck with a giant flag on it and an eagle airbrushed on the back saying america yes or america first <laughs> my first thought is not america, th- yes that person that person is really patriotic my first yeah. th- my thought is that's a trump supporter yeah you know there's there's things that are coded that make you assume the way the world is now where everything is politics um to where everything has to be segregated by politics to the point where I can tell you which fast food chains are conservative and, <laughs> and progressive, uh, right. that, you know, that to this day, it's like Chick-fil-A. That's the anti-gay marriage place. Uh, like that's the world we live in now. Uh, you know, I, I get it. If you, if you want to vote with that's, your dollar, I get it. That, that's, that makes yeah, sense. I think that's, I think what is hard for people. Cause the conversation is very much like it's one thing where like the villain is the EPA in Ghostbusters and it's like that's pretty weird. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's another thing where it's like we're dealing with conversations of immediate human rights issues and like it's it, I think it's more dire for a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and it's more immediate and so it's that idea of like these these people are supporting something which I think is fundamental like not only fundamentally wrong but like actively hurting people and and so i i definitely get it it's tough because like this director for example until i watched this movie i really liked his previous films um yeah it uh, never it never it never occurred just never occurred to me until like a week or two ago jason's like yeah you want to talk about dragged across concrete and whether or not this guy is a white supremacist (laughs) yeah and i think it's very fascinating to be like hey everybody look over here because something's going on here with this guy yeah and i don't know if we should allow this and if, Um, if the theme he kept coming back to was that taxes are too high that would be different right yeah, it's, it's totally the, different. Exactly. <laughs> if the theme he keeps coming back to is that like non-white people sometimes have to be killed because they often are prone to savagery, it's fair to say, okay, you're spreading a message in an environment where people are already dying, you know. But someone yeah. could just as easily a listener could say, well, yeah, but your your favorite action movies all support gun culture, and there's thirty thousand gun deaths in America every year, and yet you you joke about John Wick all the time. Again, I get it. The line is different for everybody. I do. I mean, if you try to show me a, a movie in which the hero you know assaults a child, I'm not going to watch that or support it with my dollar. All I'm saying right. is my arbitrary line happens to be. But if I was someone who had been a victim of police violence, I wouldn't be able to be so glib as I am on this podcast talking about it because it, you know, right. it hits closer to home. It's like, well, no, this issue has more, more immediacy. Also, you say that, but you, we watched, we all watched Extraction, where he beats up several children. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's played as comedy, where it's, it's like yeah, he's like walking. He's like, man, can you believe I just had to beat those children? It's like, yeah. I, like man, there's what's, definitely stuff. I'm getting too old yeah. for this. <laughs> there's definitely stuff with the line, um, and I uh, where like like you pointed out with Disney, is that Disney is a company that is doing things that are extremely evil. 
uh, in general. They're doing horrible things as a monopoly. They're really hurting the film industry. Um, there's way there's a lot of reason to say we shouldn't support Disney anymore, uh, but we all do because they're too goddamn big. It's 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 the same with Facebook. Everybody has different lines, and I do think everybody is to an extent hypocritical mm-hmm. about those lines. Um. And so, like, I think it's just about trying to stick to the lines that you can stick to. Uh, And everybody has, you know, um, everybody, everybody, like, has trouble with it. And so, like, I've been trying to do this more often is draw lines and be like, you know what? Not going to watch that stuff anymore. Uh, I'm going to actually try not to. Uh, to to be on the good side of something. And with this guy, it's just like... I, I get with Mel Gibson, because I watched like Hacksaw Ridge and stuff like that, because, you know, Oscar movie, got to watch them all and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But this specific director, I'm just... I, 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 I'm just... Uh, it's too much. <laughs> yeah, and Mel Gibson could be his own conversation, because I will admit to the listeners, I don't know the current status of Mel Gibson in terms of his comeback i i know that his the incidents that he became famous for i don't actually know what year his drunk driving arrest and his meltdown occurred and then there's the other thing where he was caught on tape like just screaming at that you had mentioned earlier like saying that yeah. you should be yeah. raped by uh, yeah. a racial slurs i don't know how long ago that was i know that it was a while ago if somebody wants to google it they can i think the drunk driving was mid Aughts, and then yeah. the 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 violently abusive phone call to his uh his wife uh was early like 2010 2011 2012 was, somewhere around there it was definitely between a comeback because he had a comeback he had a comeback after that and then the, <laughs> that happened yeah because the first yeah. incident i think a lot of people it's one of those things where from my point of view if there's other actors and other people willing to continue working with him and they they believe he's okay and they're saying look i know this guy we work with him like if they're saying look this was a mental health issue and and i get saying that look there's no mental illness that makes you racist but there's definitely thing where he sounded like he had gone he was having a breakdown and was just saying the worst things he could think to say because he was so enraged and was trying to make the person he's yelling at be as angry as he was. And so he was just going for the most, you know, if he had gone on longer, maybe would have accused him of being a pedophile or whatever. Cause he's just trying, he's just ranting and raving and did not sound like a person with a healthy brain. I do not like on Twitter, like every day now, there's a viral video of somebody freaking out in a grocery store or something. And some of these people seem like they're not all there. There's a freak show aspect sure. to it that I don't like, where it's like this person is clearly impaired or on, on on a substance, but because they used a racial slur in the middle of it, it's like, okay, I if there's something wrong with this person, that's that also is an, an oppressed group. I want them to get help because they are not happy either this is not this is not the face of racism it's racism is not a drunk lady yelling at a grocery store racism is a series of institutions that have been set up to basically keep one group on top all the time it fixed that yes don't don't just just you know continually make fun of the this drunk lady in a grocery store in some ways that's a distraction so if the people working with mel gibson say look He's not really like this. He was going through some stuff. He's on medication. He's apologized. He's trying to help people. I fine, fine. I don't actually know where he is with that. Um, the, yeah, me either. <laughs> I think. Yeah, I think the thing that always bothers me and why, why I, in my head, why I understand why, like, yeah, he needs to not be doing this anymore, is the realization <clears throat> that as a like powerful actor, as a director, as a producer he is a boss he is in charge of people and i think that's what people forget a lot is that this is a workplace issue that if you had a manager at best buy who was yelling this stuff uh you wouldn't want him to be a manager anymore because he's in charge of people and there's clearly some like if they're racist if they're saying stuff about uh the jews and stuff like that like it's like uh, how are you going to manage these people? How are you going yeah. to be in charge? Mm-hmm. 
And so it's that a lot where it's like it's it makes me nervous in that sense where it's like people often forget a lot of this is workplace stuff. Yeah. It is, uh, it's a we, job and it's think, a business, yeah. Yeah, I don't think people think of the entertainment industry that way because it's also artistic. Um, it's the Kubrick thing. It's the, oh, Kubrick like, abused his actors to get, you know, these amazing uh, uh, performances from them. And it's like, yeah, these are people at work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, these are people who are going into work. They're eating lunch on set. They don't want to be abused necessarily unless they've consented and had some sort of understanding this like oh mel gibson's really good it's just like doesn't matter if he treats people like shit doesn't matter if he's if he's a maniac and i don't know how he is on set but i think that's i think that's where it goes both sides because there is you know there's people like jodie foster and danny glover saying like uh no he's really he's cool he's cool and 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 it, it, it like maybe he's nice to work with on set and maybe that's why they're saying it or maybe he's cool to other famous people but if it was a someone working on his house or a cop he ran into maybe or a server at a restaurant maybe it's not the same thing right um and i don't again i don't i i understand i i as someone who you know as a creative person everyone here you automatically should bristle at the idea of like censorship and that there should be less art or whatever because it's it's always people almost always complaining about the wrong things i fans of mine know listeners of you probably don't i came from an evangelical christian background i was raised in a church that was hardcore like a real midwestern small town the apocalypse is coming church so like the christian rock stuff and the christian rap uh seeing how bad the art they made was (laughs) because they're so constrained and i was a in that environment in the 80s in the middle of like the satanic panic right the idea Mm -hmm. that rock music is hiding satanic messages in the music to this day I really, really resent that. Not because the rock songs were actually pure and righteous, but the preacher could hear a song from Kiss that is literally about how hot 16-year-olds are. (laughs) And the preacher would say, well, actually, if you play that song backwards, there's an evil message in it. (laughs) <laughs> it's like there's an evil message if you play it forwards, <laughs> right? But, and again, I, I don't, I don't want that. I don't want that music banned. It, mm-hmm. My point is that I would have much preferred a the, the preacher to give a sermon saying, "Look, the song is just about partying. I get it's fun to listen to, but there's like four songs in this album where they're celebrating the fact that, about how hot she looks and her." catholic schoolgirl uniform or you know or or something to that effect where it's really like sexualizing someone who's underage or sexualizing how innocent or she's not daddy's little girl anymore you can search you can like google song lyrics with that phrasing in it and say look you know this music it's not from the devil but it is from a guy who's like 35 and likes to bang 16 year old groupies. <laughs> Maybe listen to it in that context and understand that he's putting the, the way that they objectify women, the way that they, you know, like when your kids listen to this, I'm telling you, if your 16 year old daughter has sex with someone who looks like Gene Simmons, she's probably going to get a disease that they're going to have to name after her right. because it's it, like actually being grounded. Do you see what I'm saying? I would have preferred yeah. real criticism of, of what's in the music and they didn't do that. They instead invented this thing. And you know, the, the criticism I get about my books, it's always about the profanity. It's like the cursing in the books. It's like, well, yeah, but there's also like gruesome violence and every other thing. Why do you focus on that? And I think that's the thing is that 
we always get mad at the wrong things in art. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. and so I guess if I have a mission in life, uh, yes, I would love it if people would look at these movies as like a labor issue. If they would look at like, well, why was she made to be in a scene with this guy when she's aware of what this guy's been, it was just arrested for last year and realize that this movie does not take place in a fantasy. They're not shooting a fantasy universe. It took place in LA or wherever they shot it on a sound stage, And these are people who had to clock in every day. And yeah, probably were not in a situation where they could complain because Mel Gibson is still Mel Gibson. He's a star. And if you are, you know, a, a lighting person who's not comfortable being on set with Mel Gibson, which one of the two do you think they're going to make leave? Right. Yeah, <laughs> I've made this episode twice as long as it as it. No, yeah, no, no. I, did. Mean, I think we we were prepared. We were prepared. We were prepared. I mean, yeah, this no, is I think, I think this we... is also something that needs to be talked about for a while because there's nuance to it. Yeah, yeah. And I guess that my point was we're not the message of this is not go out and watch this movie because it's awesome or please avoid this movie because you're making the world worse. It's free to watch if you've got HBO. It it's. Yeah, uh, but but watch it, understanding who made it, understanding how it was made, and and the greater context there. Uh, I, I trust if you're listening to this podcast, you have you have the mental capacity to not hear Mel Gibson say these things and immediately adopt them as your worldview. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know it's you're yeah. not going to be brainwashed by this movie. Um, but I I did definitely made for great discussion because it's there's. There's so much, it is a very, it is a movie that is definitely of its time, but it's like the perfect example of someone trying to tackle a subject that they're like the last person who should have been tackling it, I guess. Right. Yeah. It's very ill suited to handle this subject matter. I'm very, I'm pretty open with censorship, but I've been thinking a lot about the idea of when we think, talk about should kids watch things or teenagers watch things. And I'm realizing now we should we should be basing that off of like I would say if I had like uh, if I had like a teenage kid, I wouldn't want them to watch this, not because of the nudity or the swearing, but because of the weird, subtle messages within. Exactly. Right. But, but um, the vast majority of parents in America would not want their teenager watching it because you see a woman's breasts early. Exactly. In the movie. Where it's like, yeah. no, make sure they understand the cop stuff. And this is, there's a, actually a great quote from Quentin Tarantino, who I understand that anyone who quotes Quentin Tarantino as like words of life inspiration <laughs> is a certain type of douchebag. Okay. When, when Quentin Tarantino is talking about anything but movies, he is insufferable. Yeah. <laughs> when he's talking about film and story structure in, in the history of film, he's fascinating because he knows more about film than anyone on earth and, and how film is made and, and the history. And like he can, there's like no movie they can bring up that he's not seen and can't give an, a good opinion on. He said something that I've always, has always stuck with me because everyone, when his first movies came out, interviewers would always ask him, we're like, did you were you raised on these movies, like these violent seventies action movies or, or whatever. And he says that when I was really young, my mom would not let me watch a movie like that unless she was with me. And the one that there was one specific movie he wanted to watch. And I think it was like a, a black exploitation movie or something like that it had like a lot of racial politics tied into it. And she wouldn't let him watch it. And he asked her why. And she says, because at the age you're at now, you won't understand what the movie's about. And so all you'll see is the violence. Mm. Like you'll just see the cool people shooting each other, but you're not old enough to understand why this guy's gone to war with these corrupt cops or whatever. Like the context, like this movie was made about where society was in 1968 or whenever it was made. And you're not going to get that. So all you're going to see is a bunch of people shooting each other and their heads exploding. And that, that was perfect because if, if all you're seeing is like, Oh, it's really cool and gritty the way that lady's head exploded. And if you're not old enough or educated enough to understand what was going on there or what the director was trying to say, then yeah, you're, you're not getting the same thing out of it. And and that that's the whole thing. Like it, there's no exact line for what age, you know, kids mature at different ages. 
But that's the one thing I would ask for for parents is like, if they watch it, the, you should be able to talk to them about it. And if they're not mm-hmm. old enough to talk about it, then they shouldn't be watching it. But you should be able to talk about because I didn't get that. And so when I was a kid, I would watch these G.I. Joe cartoons, which now I know these were dirt cheap, like knockoff cartoons to just advertise a toy line. But these were right wing cartoons. It was openly <laughs> oh, yeah. it was openly about like why you need the military, why you need a high tech military, why, you know, the military has to, you know, like any any case where their equipment wasn't good enough or whatever was just going to doom America because America is constantly under threat from all of these these evil sources out there and you know there was no one to talk to me about okay you understand reagan is president we're in a cold war this was made for this specific reasons i didn't have any of that context so all i came away with was guns and tanks and stuff is super super cool and heroes need that stuff to to keep us safe right yeah there's also the question of like with gi joe where it's like I was, I'm, I'm thinking about now Brooklyn Nine Nine, where it's like, what's more dangerous? Yeah, uh, a movie about racist cops or a movie about oh, cops are really funny and woke. You know, they're really, they're really goofballs. They're great, and it's like always uh, cutting up. Yeah, and and, it, and it's it's that's also a question that uh, because the content of Brooklyn Nine Nine is more left leaning. It's more, it's more, you know. Uh, uh, it's it's more inclusive, but then the overall message is kind of fucked up. <laughs> I mean, they have a black gay captain, like it, right. it is as wholesome as can be, and it's multicultural. And they, you know, they they, they will talk about racial issues. And there was a case where the sergeant got pulled over because he didn't have his police ID with him, and they talk about like racist policing or whatever. But the very next episode, they're just having like a prank war. Right, the, they're very good about LGBT rights as a message in the in the show. They're they're but, again the 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 little things are good. The overall premise is like hmm. in the real yeah. world, something like eighty five percent of police voted for Trump. Yeah, it's you know, and there's a bunch of reasons for it. It's built into the culture. There's a perception that you know the Democrats undermine their mission, or that they would cut off their funding, or whatever. That they they don't have the leeway to do their jobs, and whatever. The real culture of police work is not reflected in that show. It's putting in. So it would be the same thing if you had a workplace comedy that took place in uh, among CIA agents. And it's like all fun spy stuff and gadgets and stuff like that. It's like, well, the real CIA has a dark, dark history and the, the, the ruin they've inflicted on different parts of the world and the work they did in Central America. And there's, there's like basically back to the founding of the agency, um, that is horrifying. So I, you know, on the surface, there's nothing wrong with having a workplace comedy about spies you know and spies are fun and the subterfuge and all that but man it's hard to ignore you're putting a happy face on something that doesn't have that face in the real world so i don't know and and again someone wanting to complain could say well yeah but there's also comedies about mobsters and there's comedies about right you know that in reality reality these people are uh you know they're working in human trafficking and drugs and all that stuff but it, so comedy works that way but i don't know it just came out that they had scrapped all the scripts for the, the next season of brooklyn 99 because they realized that i guess every one they had written so far was now problematic right because uh, yeah that's the question is yeah what where oh, i mean it's it's just that it's not black and white there's no answer sweeping answer because it's like, what are comedies? It, you can't do a comedy about cops. It has to be, you know, treating that. Um, yeah. Th- like, it's like something like The Sopranos or Breaking Bad, where it's like, well, the whole point is that it's kind of subverting it and that you're on the side of this person who does monstrous things. Um, isn't it like, you know, can we not have protagonists like that anymore? No, uh, I, I think it's just. But with Brooklyn Nine Nine, it's the problem where it's that's not what they're addressing there. Right. I, I think it's, it's just, just fun you know, and games. Same thing with what Jason was talking about with that Tarantino quote, and what the conclusion we ultimately came with on this movie, where it's like, 
you have to watch these things with a context and understanding. Yeah. That said, personally, with this movie and his background, I think the context context I have gotten from him (laughs) is, I think this guy's kind of a white supremacist. And I'm not sure I should keep watching his films. Yeah, Uh, (laughs) And I can't encourage other people to. (laughs) You've mentioned something in the notes here that he is a member of like a death metal band? Yes. Yeah. He he apparently writes music and sings in at least one, maybe two different death metal bands. Uh, It's a genre that tends to attract white supremacists not not yes. entirely but you and know. that's again that's sort of cell block 99 the first time i saw cell block 99 as someone who's known you know non-racist skinheads i was just like oh he's a skinhead not a nazi he's just a skinhead um and then at the again the larger pattern it's like mm, maybe he's not just a skinhead <laughs> <in that movie." laughs> yeah they don't explicitly say it but i'm no. starting to think that's a nazi skinhead yeah uh, and he's got that that racist guy he works for that ends up saving the day, saving right. his wife. So, and then in that with the metal bl- bands, it's like not all like of that genre is. No, no, not at all. But uh, it's kind of what they're known for. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, this has been a really good conversation. Um, yeah, but I, I think I, we've I, talked. <laughs> Yeah, it's we've gone on. We've not gone on as long as the movie. You still could not have watched. You'd have a good half hour left. Uh, if yes, you were playing the movie for some reason. You were treating this as an audio track for, for the yeah. for the movie. I think yeah. we'd, I think we'd just now be at the robbery. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh man. Well. All right. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for doing the episode, Jason. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I what have to you... plug my book. Yes. Do yes. it. Do it. Uh, because this is now, again, I, I have left crack. This is now my day job is writing books. So the new one is called Zoe Punches the Future and the Dick. Please go pre-order it in person at a store so you can hear yourself saying that title to the clerk. <laughs> and also it's just better to support your local bookstores if you can. That said, if you want to order it from your computer, it's available at all of the places where you can do that from bookstore.com and Amazon and Barnes Noble and all that. Uh, that's it. Otherwise, you can you can easily find me by just googling my name on every social media platform that exists. Because again, I have to have those for my job now. Right. Exactly. I cannot, yeah. I so- cannot quit Twitter, even though I would like to. Because <laughs> my life would immediately improve yes. if I could, but yes, I can't. <laughs> I cannot. I would have to hire someone to to occasionally tweet things for me. Because uh, otherwise, you can't let people know that uh, your thing is for sale. So, uh, I will. I will. I do remember every time I've bought your book, one of your books in in person at a, at a bookstore. The clerk has looked at the title and laughed. <laughs> <laughs> So. It really is just trolling, yeah, <laughs> trolling the hypothetical person walking into a bookstore and having to say the name. Okay, um, this did is you what... have to fight for that title? <laughs> no, it, it, the one title that got rejected, book three of the John and Dave books, the final title wound up being "What the Hell Did I Just Read?" Mm-hmm. The title that I submitted to the publisher was "John, Don't Forget to Insert the Title Before You Send This to the Printer." <laughs> Which it turns out that the booksellers like Amazon, I guess I'm not the first person to think of that joke, like making it seem like a glitch because you would have to click on it, right? Like if you thought somebody messed up the cover, yeah. you yeah. would have to like immediately pick it up. That's that's the whole point of these titles. It's like you can't leave that on the shelf. It's called Zoe Punches the Future in the Dick. Um, but they, they're like, no, Amazon, like, like they don't want to get 800 messages a day of like, hey, you, the author, you've got some author's note that's... But and the cover is gonna be like a generic placeholder and it's like I don't know. Yeah, I can see the people at Amazon like, all right, real cute. Real right. cute joke. We're not doing it. Uh, we're not yeah. doing this. Yeah, we're not doing it. No, we're you're not the one who's gonna to have to deal with all the customer service emails from people trying to say and ha ha, you you accidentally didn't put the final title on this thing. So right. anyway. Oh, um, uh, Dave, right, I guess you better tell, people, tell them about what we got going on. Yeah, we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash gamefully unemployed. It's the podcast network you're listening to this on. 
Uh, on our Patreon, we have exclusive podcasts like Tom and Jeff Watch Batman and Fox Mulder is a Maniac. So mm. you can check out those exclusive podcasts there. And there's other tiers like we watch movies with our patrons every Friday night. Uh, we have we have, we have all sorts of stuff there, so check it out. Most yeah. of the podcasts are very reasonable in length. They're not they're not feature yes. length podcasts like this. <laughs> Most of them are very. You can get them in under an hour. Most of them. Most spoilers. Of them. Spoilers for uh, me and Adam Ganser's final Twilight podcast. Uh, it's it's not quite four hours. <laughs> I'll give it that. <laughs> So look forward to that. That's tomorrow, actually. Yeah. Uh, final episode of Guy Light. <laughs> well, quite literally uh, take up your entire afternoon. <laughs>